Hi, everyone, and welcome to a presentation of the Lake County Forest Preserve's Healthy Hedges program, which focuses on the invasive species common buckthorn, its effects on local landscapes, and perhaps most importantly, what you can do to help. My name is Brett Pito, and I'm the Environmental Communications Specialist here at the Forest Preserves, and co-presenting with me today is my colleague, Matt. Uh, Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Olson. I'm the manager of Restoration Ecology here with the Lake County Forest Preserve District. Wonderful. Thank you. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, we will be focusing on the invasive species common buckthorn today. Um, so I'd like to start off with just a few uh, facts and figures here. Uh, first off, the fact that common buckthorn is the most common tree in the Chicago region. And that's according to a 2020 tree census conducted by the U.S. Forest Service and the Morton Arboretum uh, in Illinois. Um, buckthorn is 36% of the tree canopy in Chicagoland, which is kind of a stunning number um, when you consider just how many tree species are out there. And unfortunately, there is bad news, which is that buckthorn makes up 52.2% of the tree landscape in Lake County. Uh, so more than half of all trees on the landscape in Lake County are buckthorn. And for a whole host of issues that Matt and I will discuss today, uh, buckthorn is a real problem for native plants, animals, uh, and the health of, of local habitats. And it will continue to be a problem until truly the entire community is involved, from private landowners to homeowners associations, golf courses to garden clubs, businesses, school districts, um, and the forest preserves itself. But together, the good news is that public and private partners are already working toward a buckthorn-free Chicago region. So a quick overview of some of the main topics that uh, we're going to discuss today. Uh, first up is buckthorn identification and ecology, how you can actually uh, tell that a plant is buckthorn, uh, why we have set the goal of eradicating buckthorn from Lake County, the extent of its population and its impacts on local landscapes, and of course, a very practical section towards the end, how you can help the situation. So when we talk about uh, buckthorn in Lake County, there's really two species that are found here. There's common buckthorn or Rhamnus cathartica, as well as glossy buckthorn, uh, Ferengula ulnus. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, we'll be focusing mostly on common buckthorn or Rhamnus cathartica uh, because glossy buckthorn is uh, more of a wetland plant or species. So it's found in uh, very marshy habitats and wet places. Uh, so it, it may be found in some home landscapes, but primarily what we're uh, what, what most people are going to encounter in their home landscapes or in businesses and HOAs and, and things like that is uh, the species common buckthorn. Um, common buckthorn grows to about 25 feet tall. It's kind of considered a small tree or a large shrub. Uh, it has multiple stems. It has kind of a loose uh, branching pattern, kind of scraggly looking. Um, it has a, um, uh, just a very open, kind of scraggly, uh, messy structure to it. Uh, one thing I, I will note about this plant is that it is, is uh, dioecious, meaning that it has separate male and female plants. Uh, so you're probably familiar with most plants that have uh, both male and female parts of the same flower and they're pollinated uh, on the same plant. Uh, but buckthorn is somewhat unique in that it has uh, separate male and female plants. So uh, there's um, some plants that produce pollen and some plants that produce seed. Uh, so buckthorn uh, first came to North America, uh, presumably in the early 1800s. Uh, we assume that a lot of that, uh, a lot of the reason for bringing it to North America was for um, creating hedges or trying to recreate um, uh, landscapes that, that people were familiar with in, in Europe. Uh, it, it unfortunately became uh, naturalized in the early 1900s, meaning that it, it was escaping cultivation. It was growing and, and establishing and spreading all on its own without the benefit of people planting it. Uh, and that happened in the early 1900s and has quickly spread across. Uh, the northeastern United States and the Midwest and even into uh, parts of Canada. Uh, it has an affinity for disturbed places, so any any place that's been disturbed by human uh, impact, such as through agriculture or development and making roads or even 
uh, just removing trees and uh, creating fragmentation to the habitat uh, seems to create those disturbances and those edges that uh, buckthorn really takes hold of and can establish very easily. Uh, what you can see here is the spread uh, across uh, the United States currently uh, of common buckthorn. Uh, it is uh, reported from 35 states, as you can see from this map. Uh, but again, primarily it is, uh, it is a, a, a bigger factor in the northern and eastern parts of this range, primarily in the uh, New England and mid-Atlantic states, as well as the Great, uh, Great Lakes states. Uh, but it is found uh, in, in lots of other places, unfortunately. In terms of identification, uh, the leaf of buckthorn, as what you see here on the screen, is kind of an egg-shaped, uh, kind of dark, glossy green, um, finely toothed edges, and uh, has three to five pairs of veins uh, that are impressed into the top of the leaf. So if you look at a leaf, uh, what you can see from the photo here is that they look like they've been pressed into it. Uh, they're, they're depressed from the, the top surface of the leaf. Uh, when we talk about um, branching patterns of trees, and some, sometimes that can help identify plants. Uh, so there's some plants that have an exhibit, uh, an opposite um, branching pattern, which you kind of see in the lower picture, the two buds at the end of that are opposite, where you see two, two, two buds from uh, separate leaves or, or stems that are going to grow off of that plant at exactly the same point, but on opposite sides of the stem. Uh, another branching pattern that we see is called alternate, which you can kind of see in the in the top photo there, where you have one leaf coming off at one node, and then further up the stem, uh, there's another leaf coming off of the the other node, or coming off the node at another point, going the other direction. So, uh, typically plants are either opposite or alternate, uh, but buckthorn is one of the few plants that that exhibits both branching patterns, and uh, the name for that is called subopposite. And what you, you can kind of see that in, the, in both pictures here where you have the same plant, buckthorn, uh, with exhibiting a, an alternate pattern on the top photo and an opposite pattern on the bottom photo. The other thing I'll mention is the at the end of each twig, you'll notice that thorn or pointy, point, uh, pointy uh, part of the, the branch. And, and that's part of how buckthorn got its name. Um, if you're not familiar with buckthorn or the thorns of buckthorn, I encourage you to walk through a buckthorn thicket and, and you'll, you'll find them very quickly or they'll find you. Um, but it, it's not a, a thorn in a botanical sense like a, uh, a rose bush. It's really just an aborted stem that stopped growing and is broken off into this, this sharp point. Uh, but again, this is, this is part of the reason why buckthorn got its name. And you can kind of see on the, the bottom photo uh, that the, um, the thorn part is coming through those two buds, which almost look like the hooves of a deer or a, or a buck. So that's that's partly uh, what we believe that's how, that's how buckthorn got its name. Uh, the bark of buckthorn is somewhat variable throughout its uh, uh, lifespan. Uh, when they're young, they are kind of a smooth grayish brown color with numerous little white lenticels or white dots called lenticels. Uh, and as it matures, it turns more to a, uh, a darker charcoal uh, blackish color almost with this exfoliating or curly edges and peeling bark to them. And we have some photos here. So that's the uh, young stem. And then the, the next couple photos show as it as um, uh, stems are getting older and you see that that peeling exfoliating bark uh, in the next couple of photos. Uh, perhaps the best diagnostic feature for determining whether or not you have buckthorn is to scrape off some of that that outer bark. Um, and it will reveal that that orange, bright orange inner bark, as well as a yellow sapwood, which you can see in that that photo there. So uh, simply just scraping off some of that exterior bark will reveal those that coloration to it. And to my knowledge, there's no other plant in the Chicago region that has that orange inner bark and yellow um, uh, inner inner bark or heartwood. So uh, scrape off some of that bark, and if you see that that coloration, you're you're dealing with buckthorn. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on the flowers. They're very inconspicuous. Um, they're the, pretty much the same color as the leaves. Um, they uh, bloom kind of late spring and uh, are gone very quickly. And uh, again, only about a quarter inch in in uh, diameter and uh, gone before you know it. And most people never even see them. Uh, the fruits uh, develop from those flowers and they turn into those uh, dark purple, almost black colored uh, fruits or berry, the berry-like fruits. Uh, we think of them as, as berries, but they're actually botanically, they're uh, considered a droop, which means like it, ha it means it has a, a hard seed in the center surrounded by this fleshy outer coating, similar to what you'd see in cherries or peaches. 
Um, but uh, in cherries and peaches, they only have one seed per uh, per fruit. Uh, buckthorn is a little bit different in that it can each fruit contains uh, three to four seeds. Uh, they ripen in uh, late summer and can persist in on the trees until uh, winter time. They're primarily eaten by birds such as uh, American robins and uh, cedar waxwings, uh, but also another invasive species uh, and an exotic bird called a European starling. Um, so another another way that this uh, plant is spread through the landscape is through uh, the birds and unfortunately that other exotic um, species starlings. So why why do we in the forest preserve and other natural areas managers want to eradicate buckthorn? Uh, well, in 2014, uh, leadership from the the forest preserve as well as partners and other um, other folks in our region came together and tried to uh, set a vision for Lake County, and uh, it, it very quickly turned into uh, that we needed long term strategic strategic planning and thinking about the hundred year vision for Lake County because uh, we want our th these landscapes to be healthy and sustainable for many generations to come. And the, we realized that buckthorn and invasive species are probably the greatest threat to our nat natural areas, uh, not only the native species, but also the function of those ecosystems. So uh, controlling invasive species and, and especially buckthorn, which is probably the, the, the largest culprit across uh, many of our landscapes, uh, is an important factor in the sustainability of, of these habitats. Uh, to come. So we've had many objectives and uh, tasks that we've put together over those years and objectives, uh, including uh, we have updated that for our roadmap to 2025, which we're working through right now to try to protect uh, and restore these ecological habitats. Well, great. Thank you, Matt. So now for this section, um, I'm going to go over some of the effects that Buckthorn has uh, on local habitats. Uh, and first, I'd like to start off with kind of a rhetorical question that Matt and I um, hear from folks sometimes, which is, you know, why can't we just let nature take its course? You know, buckthorn is already here. It's been here for 150, 200 years. Um, obviously, it's it's finding a, a space in, in local um, natural areas. So why can't we just sit back, um, not take any action, and just, just let... Uh, let things play out. Um, well, over the next several slides here, uh, we're going to build a case for why we should be taking action to remove buckthorn. Uh, so the photo that you see here, uh, I took in early November, and you can see one of the uh, most striking traits of buckthorn, uh, even just glancing at this photo, which is that it produces leaves earlier in the spring, but also retains them longer into the fall than native plants. Uh, so you see the, the canopy trees, you know, their leaves are changing colors and you know, falling to the ground, but it seems like, you know, about halfway, the bottom half of the photo, there's a pretty, you know, thick, strong ribbon of green um, still, still going strong. Uh, so that, that is a key trait of buckthorn. And the fact that it does hold on to its leaves this long into November and sometimes even into December, I've seen um, this can deprive ground layer vegetation of sunlight and reduce native plant diversity and abundance. You can just see that it's uh, this, it's a dense uh, leaf layer soaking up a lot of sunlight. Also, Matt mentioned uh, earlier that uh, birds do eat uh, the buckthorn fruits or droops. Um, here you see a yellow rumped uh, warbler nibbling on some, some fruit there. Um, but in fact, buckthorn has very little nutritional value for wildlife, uh, and its seeds have a diuretic effect on birds, which aids its proliferation across the landscape. Uh, so the diuretic effect means that uh, the bird will eat the fruits and expel them fairly quickly, quicker than they would uh, another food source. Um, and you can start to imagine how uh, a bird could eat some berries, you know, perhaps in one area, uh, fly to another area, to a yard or a forest preserve, uh, and expel those seeds and you can begin to see how buckthorn can spread across the landscape and across property boundaries. 
Um, buckthorn also reproduces rapidly and far earlier than most native trees and shrubs. And each of those three to four seeds within those fruits uh, can remain viable in the soil for anywhere between two all the way up to six years. Uh, so uh, it is it is uh, quite a quite a persistent plant. If that weren't enough, um, here you see uh, kind of kind of a typical view of what you get uh, when you you know kind of duck under into into a buckthorn thicket. Um, so it's it's usually kind kind of a barren a barren outlook. There's a, a lot of buckthorn above and not too much growing below. A lot of bare soil. Um, and this is partly due to the fact, as I mentioned just before, that buckthorn soaks up a lot of sunlight, but also the fact that it produces emodin, which you see the chemical structure uh, up in the corner there. Um, so emodin is a chemical compound that protects buckthorn plants and fruits from pathogens, uh, but deters native wildlife from eating it. Uh, and this chemical also inhibits the growth of nearby native plants and microorganisms uh, in the soil. Another trait of buckthorn is that it has greater nitrogen levels than all other um, native trees that don't fix uh, nitrogen. Um, so its leaves contain more nitrogen than other plant species. Um, and this seemingly simple basic fact uh, leads to ac actually what I would think of as a cascade of, of effects um, on local landscapes. So starting with this simple fact that its leaf litter contains more nitrogen causes the leaves to decompose more rapidly once they finally do fall to the ground. This changes nitrogen and pH levels in the soil, which leads to bare soil conditions, weakens existing plants by exposing their root systems, as you can kind of see in this photo here, increases the, sus the susceptibility to soil erosion, and that disturbance causes a rapid increase in the populations of soil arthropods which then consume food resources too rapidly, and they kind of eat themselves out of house and home, causing a to which can cause a total collapse in those soil arthropod populations. And those populations form the base of food webs that support many mammal and bird species. So you can see the chain of events, just starting from that fact of higher nitrogen levels in buckthorn weaves, leading to a a drop in food available for mammal and bird species. Also, herbivores such as this white-tailed deer here um, will feed more heavily on the remaining native plants, um, both inside and perhaps both outside and perhaps inside uh, buckthorn thickets, uh, which further reduces native plant cover and diversity. And once natal plant food sources are reduced in that way, animal populations can begin to decline as well. So there are a lot of effects that kind of stack and compound on each other um, in the case of buckthorn. Yeah, uh, I'll just reiterate what uh, Brett said. There are many compounding impacts. Um, and what we see in this, this diagram kind of illustrates that. Uh, so as buckthorn invades a site, if you just kind of follow the arrows here, um, it leads to native plant diversity and density being reduced because of that increased shade and emodin and other effects uh, from the buckthorn. Uh, that leads to insect and mammal herbivores targeting the remaining native species. So there's there's fewer native plants on the landscape, but those are the only plants that those um, those other animals will will consume. Uh, so they're even further reducing the amount of uh, native plants on the landscape, and that leads to uh, increased bare soil, uh, which is one of those disturbance factors, which we talked about in the beginning, which leads to uh, increased buckthorn germination. So what we see here is, is really a, a, a feedback loop where once we have buckthorn invading a site, it really leads to only, um, or only more buckthorn. So we're sustaining buckthorn uh, in, this, in this loop and it's very difficult to break, break free from that. So uh, once we, once we have buckthorn, it seems to create an environment that just creates more buckthorn. 
It also has some uh, serious impacts to native wildlife. Uh, what you see in the, the photo here is a uh, native community called the uh, Northern Flatwoods. So the, we have these shallow pond areas that uh, are hydrated in the springtime. And these are very important for amphibians, such as uh, the blue spotted salamander, which you see here in the photo, as well as a wood frog. So these amphibians are overwintering in the upland areas. And when these ponds fill up in the spring, they the adults move down into these ponds for uh, breeding and laying their eggs. So if you ever walk through one of these areas in the, the springtime, you might see this gelatinous mass, uh, which you see in the photo here. Um, this is a, an, a salamander egg mass, and each one of those little black dots that you see in there is a developing embryo. But unfortunately, when we have buckthorn invading these types of habitats, uh, that buckthorn invasion with the high nitrogen leaf litter uh, leads to increased decomposition, and not just decomposition of the, the buckthorn leaf litter, but also any other, any other organic material that's in there. That high nitrogen is almost like adding fertilizer to that system, so it increases decomposition of uh, all the organic material that could be on the, the soil surface. Uh, and that really leads to a reduction in dissolved oxygen in that water column because that decomposition is an aerobic process. So it's taking water out or taking oxygen out of that water to complete that decomposition, uh, which leaves the, the water very oxygen deficient. And it causes those eggs essentially to suffocate and die. Uh, so they're not able to hatch or they're not, these animals are not able to uh, undergo their metamorphosis. They just there's not enough oxygen in that water to sustain these populations. So we have this this cascading effect of uh, buckthorn invasion leading to impacts to wildlife through a uh, through a number of steps. We also uh, see impacts from emodin on wildlife. Uh, this is research that was done uh, through the Lincoln Park Zoo and Northern Illinois University, and some some of the research actually occurred here in Lake County and some of our forest preserves. But uh, researchers looked at the effects of emodin on these developing uh, salamanders and frogs. And what you see here in uh, the photo labeled A is a normal developing uh, embryo, uh, but what you see in the B through F are developing embryos that have been uh, come in contact with emodin, and you can see the the impacts that it's having on them. Uh, there's uh, lots of spinal and facial malformations caused by uh, by emodin, as well as higher increased mortality. And unfortunately, by the time you look at the uh, that uh, photo F, you can't even hardly tell that that was a, uh, a salamander embryo. You can see on the graphs the very steep curves here, meaning uh, that very small changes in the concentration of emodin in these environments can lead to some very significant impacts to uh, the, these populations, both in malformations and in terms of mortality. And why are salamanders and and, uh, and amphibians important? Well, salamanders really can 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 help control mosquito populations. Uh, so uh, back to that same blue spotted salamander. That's the adult form there, but uh, the the larval form or the the similar to a tadpole and a and a frog species, uh, which you'll see in the next photo here. They have uh, they they live in the water column. They have those external gills that you see there. So they're they're living in these water columns and and from the time they hatch until they undergo metamorphosis. And research has shown that uh, that these blue spotted salamanders and uh, salamanders in general really target mosquito larvae. And it was actually their preferred prey item uh, when they were given multiple choices to, to choose from. These laboratory experiments showed that mosquitoes were their preferred choice. Um, and they can be very effective at controlling mosquitoes in, the, in these, uh, these ponds. So it takes roughly 120 days for a, a, a salamander to undergo metamorphosis from the time it hatches. And they found that uh, these, these um, uh, salamanders can eat up to 144 mosquito larvae per day. So uh, one developing salamander could eat 17,000 or more uh, mosquito larvae. And uh, the research showed that having salamanders in a pond was an effective method for controlling mosquitoes. Uh, so this is just another way of uh, how buckthorn can impact that cycle. Uh, and cause some serious impacts to us as humans trying to live in these environments adjacent to our natural areas that having healthy ecosystems with healthy salamander populations because of uh, controlling buckthorn uh, can have some impacts to us as well or some benefits to us as well. We've talked a lot about the impacts and how uh, buckthorn is damaging to these environments, but 
what's the extent of the impact or how widespread is buckthorn across our landscape? Um, and Fred alluded to this in the, the opening uh, remarks here that uh, in 2010 and again in 2020, uh, the, the Chicago Region Tree Census Report uh, was, was created by the uh, Morton Arboretum and the uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service. And this is essentially a, a, a census of all the trees in the Chicago region. Uh, and unfortunately, it revealed that buckthorn was the most common tree. Uh, you can see here in the series of graphs uh, how buckthorn has changed from 2010 to 2020 uh, and unfortunately has increased. So across the entire Chicago region, uh, buckthorn, European buckthorn or common buckthorn makes up 36% of uh, all tree species in, uh, in, in the Chicago region. And if you look at some of the other um, species that are, are shown on these graphs, many of them are lower quality trees or um, invasive species or non-native or ornamentals themselves. So unfortunately, uh, there's a, a, a buckthorn is just dwarfing everything else in the landscape. As, as Brett alluded to before, unfortunately, Lake County is the most affected county in the region, uh, where over 50% of our trees are, are buckthorn. Uh, so it's very critical that we think about this and, and try to work together on the, some of these solutions. But you can see uh, the two photos here are very typical scenes as you uh, go through our region and, and specifically Lake County, where uh, you have, might have some overstory trees that are, are still alive and intact growing but the understory is is been completely removed and replaced by buckthorn uh the top photo kind of a growing season a photo and and even in the the bottom photo uh again as these uh other trees are uh changing color and dropping leaves in the fall the buckthorn stays very green and, and very obvious in that landscape again uh another graph from the the 2010 uh study showing how buckthorn kind of dwarfs everything else in Lake County and this, and this data is specific to Lake County. Uh, again, as we go down that list, the, the next couple on that list are green ash, which has been uh, impacted by uh, uh, the emerald ash borer. Uh, white spruce is an ornamental tree that's not native to Lake County. It's been planted, widely planted as one of the next common trees here. Uh, black cherry and box elder, white ash, again, all native, but uh, Kind of growing in, in weedier conditions or uh, popping up uh, in, in lots of places. Uh, Northern white cedar is uh, another somewhat native tree. It's not native to our region here in Lake County, um, but is it's widely planted as an ornamental. And it's kind of disturbing that we have to get pretty far down on this list to get to some oak species. And oaks are really important because uh, that was the historic landscape cover that dominated Lake County. Um, but in, in 2010, the Forest Preserve District, along with other partners in the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, uh, tried to look at where their oak trees were on the landscape or where those oak dominated communities were on their landscapes and look back at um, historic accounts from uh, early aerial photographs as well as uh, early settlers' accounts and uh, surveying accounts from the 1830s, 1840s. Uh, and created some maps of where oaks were occurred across the landscape at that time versus where they were in 2010. And unfortunately, we've lost about 88% of those oak-dominated communities in Lake County over that time. Uh, it's also important to note that about 70% of the remaining oak woodlands are on private land. So uh, preserving oak communities is not just a forest preserve issue or concern. This is a concern for the entire community. And again, oaks are uh, a keystone species, meaning that they uh, that many other species uh, depend or rely on oaks for their survival. Uh, so we see in the photo um, insects that are eating acorns and uh, small mammals and rodents and other birds sometimes eat acorns. Um, and then there's there's animals that eat animals that eat the acorns. Uh, so there, there's lots of uh, lots of interactions between oaks and uh, wildlife. Uh, and is, oaks are very important and more important than other tree species for supporting these uh, these wildlife species. Even uh, the small warblers uh, that are migrating through seem to their their migration seems to be timed very significantly to uh, when oaks are flowering and the leaves are emerging, and they're probably fluttering around those uh, those emerging leaves, eating the insects that are coming off of their that are hanging around those those emerging those leaves. So. Lots of interactions here and all relying on oaks 
Uh, very recently, I just learned of uh, a study that that showed that uh, bumblebees uh, are have been reported to be uh, have lots of are found to have lots of uh, oak pollen on them, uh, even though bees are not important for pollinating oaks. Uh, there is there appears to be some interaction between bumblebees and oaks because they're they're so covered in that oak pollen. So uh, it, again, it, we don't know all those. We don't even know what interactions we <laughs> that that are happening between oaks and the environment. But uh, this is very very critical. Uh, one other thing to note about pollinators in uh, our region is moths and butterflies are very important for pollinating in some places. Uh, and oaks are known to support over 500 species of moths and buckthorn or moths and butterflies here in, in Lake County. So now at this point in the program, you may be wondering um, how you can help. What, you know, what steps you can take in your daily life to uh, remove buckthorn and ideally replace it with um, with native plants and oak trees. Uh, so actually, that's that's one of my first points here, which is that you can take steps to make your yard or if you don't have a yard, you know, perhaps you live in an apartment or a condo um, or a townhome. Uh, taking steps, you know, on, on your neighborhood's property or volunteering at a park district, wherever you have influence, um, helping make those lands more attractive to wildlife and better supportive of wildlife. Uh, so you may be familiar with um, butterfly gardens and pollinator gardens. Uh, specifically, um, monarch butterfly gardens have gained a lot of popularity in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, those are always a great thing to to start and uh, require um, not much maintenance once you once you get them going. Um, there are certain species of uh, shrubs and trees that you can plant uh, that are beneficial, particularly beneficial to migrating and year round uh, migrating birds and birds that stay uh, in the county year round. Um, and these sorts of steps contribute to that regional recovery of oak ecosystems, um, which Matt mentioned, that with 70% uh, of our remaining oaks uh, existing on private lands, um, this, this issue and this concern goes beyond the boundaries of the forest preserves. It goes beyond the boundaries of any one single landowner. Um, so it does take us all working together to make a difference. Um, you can take steps to protect and restore high quality natural areas. Uh, so a couple ways you could do that with the forest preserves is uh, by becoming a volunteer. Um, we have many uh, restoration, uh, habitat restoration work days going on every week and every month. Um, volunteering uh, training is provided for volunteers for free. So. Uh, if you're interested in learning how to remove buckthorn and other invasive species, uh, we have a lot of experienced staff uh, and volunteers who would be happy to, uh, to teach you how to do that. Uh, you can also uh, identify buckthorn in your home landscape uh, using the information that Matt and I have covered earlier today, um, but also on, uh, on our website, uh, which we'll cover in more detail in just a moment. And once you've identified buckthorn, consider removing it and replacing it with those beneficial native plant species uh, that we're that we're talking about today. So I always find it helpful to provide some visual before and after comparisons of what buckthorn removal actually does. Um, in this case, to to a local yard. Uh, so this was taken by. Uh, a resident of Lake County. Uh, this is a before photo um, prior to removing buckthorn. And this is the after photo. And even if you, you know, aren't aren't a botanist or a plant expert, you can even see just from looking at the two photos how much more light is being let in um, once once that buckthorn is removed from the equation. Um, it just, to me personally, looks like a much more inviting, airy, you know, light-filled, welcoming space. Um, so even for aesthetic reasons, <laughs> you know, in, in, addition to, uh, in addition to all the ecological reasons, um, 
it can be a benefit uh, to remove buckthorn. So the Forest Preserves has developed uh, a whole suite of resources uh, to help you in in your quest um, to you know, to create healthy healthy habitats in your community. Um, one of our marquee resources is a partnered publication called Healthy Hedges, which you see on the left side of your screen. Uh, so that is a brochure that's available online and also in print at the Forest Preserves facilities. Uh, it contains um, common and scientific names of 60, 60 uh, recommended uh, native plants um, that the Forest Preserves and other partners have identified as uh, good replacements for what for what you could or should plant uh, after removing buckthorn. So as you can see, it covers everything from small, you know, ground layer herbaceous plants to shrubs to uh, small trees, all the way up to tall, you know, tall canopy trees, a hundred feet tall. Um, so you know, truly a wide sampling that uh, that you know hopefully contains a, a good variety of species for. That, that's suitable for almost any property out there. Um, while you're removing buckthorn, uh, we've uh, produced a sign that's helpful to display for that. So uh, this on the right side of your screen, you see in the, the invasive species removal in progress sign. Uh, so perhaps you're you know just getting started on your journey or you're right in the middle of it and you want to start um, advertising your efforts. Uh, this is a sign you can uh, download for free uh, from our website and display um, on your property, you know, maybe taped up in a window, displayed on your mailbox, uh, something of that sort. Um, and on the flip side of this sign are some helpful talking points um, for having conversations with your neighbors, um, because, you know, as we've seen, buckthorn removal uh, creates a pretty distinct <laughs> visual difference on the landscape. And sometimes that can invite some questions from from neighbors. Uh, so there are some good uh, good facts and figures for you uh, to share uh, with folks who are interested. I mentioned a bit earlier that um, a lot of these resources can be found on the Forest Preserves website. Uh, so we have two web pages that are dedicated uh, to buckthorn removal and replacement. Uh, so on the left side of your screen, uh, you see a screenshot of our lcfpd.org slash buckthorn webpage, uh, which contains videos, articles, blog posts, um, all about helping you identify buckthorn, the tools and techniques uh, you need uh, to remove it, um, tips and tricks for herbicide acquisition and application, things of that sort. Uh, on the right side of your screen, you see our native plants and healthy hedges website. So that contains, as you might guess, our healthy hedges publication, um, as well as a few others, healthy habitats. Um, so this is kind of the clearinghouse of information for uh, what plants we would recommend that you plant uh, once buckthorn removal uh, is complete. So those links are there at the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll also have that in the video description. I mentioned some of those uh, some of those videos that we have available on the website here on the top row. Uh, you see the screenshots for them. Uh, so. These three videos all star Matt and uh, the last video uh, in the top right corner there also stars Kelly Schultz, one of our stewardship ecologists, um, but they cover herbicide tips and tricks, tips to identify buckthorn in the fall, which is an especially good time um, because remember it holds on to its leaves later in the season, as well as the tools and techniques that the forest preserves uses um, to remove it. Uh, there are also before and after visual comparisons uh, of buckthorn removal. And in the bottom right corner there, uh, you see um, some of the identifying pictures uh, that we have on the website, a slideshow of those sorts of photos to help you puzzle out whether a plant is indeed buckthorn. Uh, perhaps one of 
perhaps the other, you know, most uh, most visible or prominent resources um, that we've developed in recent years is the Buckthorn Free Garden Flag, uh, which was made possible by um, the Preservation Foundation of the Lake County Forest Preserves. Uh, so this is exactly what it sounds like, exactly what it looks like. Uh, it is a garden flag featuring um, watercolors of native plants uh, painted uh, in-house by Forest Preserve staff. Uh, it's a very you know, bright, attractive, uh, colorful addition to, I would say, almost any home landscape. Uh, the actual flag itself is a uh, size of 12.5 by 18 inches. It's printed on weather-resistant vinyl. Um, and uh, it actually comes with the metal stand uh, that you see in the photos there. Um, and maybe the very best news is that uh, the garden flag is free to Lake County residents. Um, the way you can you can try to get one is by filling out a, a quick application on our website at that lcfpd.org slash buckthorn page. Uh, just a few basic contact uh, inf you know, few basic few basic details for your contact info. Um, and then we ask you to upload uh, two to six photos of your home landscape showing that it is indeed buckthorn free. Uh, Matt and I receive those applications and we review them you know individually uh, and decide whether to uh, to award a flag. Uh, so, as of today, when we're recording this, which is February 29th, 2024, uh, we have approved 112 flag applications since launching the program in September 2022. So more than 100 in about a year and a half, not quite a year and a half. So a few more tips for uh, maintaining a buckthorn-free landscape. Uh, we recommend prioritizing the removal of fruit-bearing trees. Uh, so Matt said earlier that uh, buckthorn is a dioecious species, which means male and female plants are, are separate. Um, so fruit-bearing trees uh, can produce you know, thousands of berries each growing season uh, or thousands of fruits um, and help keep that cycle going of buckthorn be getting more buckthorn. So removing those fruit bearing trees can help begin to break that cycle. And uh, you know, also the fact that the seed, you know, that those seeds remain viable in the seed bank for up to six years uh, start to interrupt that process of buckthorn regenerating itself, if you will. Um, herbicide application and follow-up are are critical steps. Uh, in successful buckthorn removal, and Matt is going to cover that in just a moment. Late fall through winter is the best time for removal and herbicide application. Um, during the winter, uh, you know, soil is frozen, and this this helps prevent more disturbance to the soil, um, and as well as damage to you know any native plants that may be surrounding um, buckthorn. Um, so. That's that's kind of a prime reason for it, uh, as well as herbicide application tends to be more effective in winter. Um, I mentioned the viability of the seeds in the seed bank already. Uh, hand pulling uh, resprouts, so you know, small resprouts that may come up in the in the year or the growing season following removal, um, is really only practical when they're small in number or or small in size or few in number. Um, we also often get questions about uh, brush pile disposal options. You know, what do you actually do with the buckthorn once you've once you've cut it down? Uh, so we recommend checking with your municipality, your HOA if you have one, your fire department, perhaps your township um, for options. Uh, some communities will have uh, brush or yard waste pickup days. Um, you know. Perhaps they're scheduled across the entire community. I've also heard of some, some others that, that offer this service by request. Um, you can also turn buckthorn into wood chips. Uh, you can do that yourself if you're, you know, if you're experienced and qualified to use that sort of machinery or hire a landscaping company to do that for you. Um, 
The method the forest preserves uses uh, typically is burning brush piles, uh, but I will caution that this is not allowed in all areas. So again, please check your ordinances, check with your municipality, your fire department uh, for what is allowed in your area. And another before and after photo comparison here. As, as Brett mentioned, uh, brush pile burning is, is the forest preserves method or primary method for just disposing of the, the cut material. Uh, but again, e each municipality is different. Uh, there's lots of uh, individual ordinances for, for each community or rules with your HOA. So uh, before you start any, any brush pile burning, make sure you understand what's allowable in, in your community. Uh, if you are able to burn, uh, just have some words of caution to make sure that you're uh, using, uh, not burning around other flammable materials, including uh, if there's lots of leaf litter on the ground that can cause those brush piles to spread and catch and and uh, get you some bonus areas that you might not be uh, uh, wanting to burn. Uh, so we, we also recommend keeping fires away from any structures uh, such as, um, you know, homes, uh, desirable trees, garages, anything with uh, vinyl siding uh, will be greatly impacted by the, the heat from these brush piles, unfortunately. Uh, we recommend burning only when winds are low. Uh, the, the slides has 25 miles per hour, and that will be highly variable uh, depending on your community. Uh, if it's forecasted to be a 25 mile an hour wind, if you're in a very dense wooded community, you may not get any, any wind there at all. But if you're out in the open, that 25 miles per hour uh, could be extreme and and more than you can handle. So uh, being aware of uh, what you can manage and what you can handle, uh, what you can put out if you need to uh, is a is a is a big factor more so than the the wind and 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 the other weather condition. You want to always make sure you have a water source ready to be able to put out the fire uh, if you need to. Uh, and we recommend burning uh, in the winter. Again, that's a is a great time to. Uh, get out and and uh, get some exercise and and uh, remove the buckthorn. It's a great time of year to do that. Uh, but also that extra snow on the ground uh, covering that leaf litter is a great time to burn because you don't have to worry about those piles spreading and uh, and moving beyond what you're trying to burn. Uh, always have a contingency plan and a cell phone with you at all times in case you need to call 911 for help uh, and and never leave your fire unattended. Okay, so what can you do to uh, maintain a buckthorn-free landscape? Well, first you need to make it buckthorn-free. Uh, and, and we've talked about this uh, a, a little bit so far, but a uh, smaller buckthorn in your landscape uh, can be addressed with uh, small tools, which you see in the, the lower photo here. Uh, we have uh, some loppers at the bottom. Those are good for uh, removing buckthorn, anything up to about your thumb diameter. Uh, anything larger than that, uh, up to about two to three inches, you're going to want to use a, uh, a hand, you can use a hand saw, which are kind of shown in the center of that photo. Uh, but if you have larger material than that, or larger, lots, uh, lots of buckthorn across your landscape, you may need to think about other mechanical methods, such as, um, using a chainsaw or, or other equipment or, or hiring a landscape contractor potentially to help out with that effort. Uh, so a little bit of elbow grease in order to remove the buckthorn to get that out of the landscape. Uh, but then we, we do recommend using an herbicide solution uh, to the cut stumps in order to prevent them from re-sprouting. And it's important to note that you don't need to apply that across the entire stump. Uh, what you see in that upper photo, uh, that reddish pink color uh, that's shown is the actual herbicide solution that's been applied to that. And you, you notice it's only applied to the outer uh, portions of the, the bark. Uh, that's the only par portion that's really alive and translocating material. So if we can uh, apply the herbicide to that, that will effectively uh, soak into the plant and get down to the root system and, and kill the plant, which is what we're, we're trying to do here. We don't want it to re-sprout. We have uh, some recommendations for herbicides. Uh, we recommend using herbicides with the active ingredient triclopyr, which you see on the screen there. Uh, it's sold under many different brand or trade names, such as Garlon, Element, Tahoe, uh, lots of generic versions as well. Um, but it, it's important to note that it comes in two formulations, uh, 3A or uh, an, an amine and an ester. Uh, the amine is usually sold with a 3 or 3A in the title and the the uh, amine, uh, excuse me, the ester is usually four, uh, sold with the number four in the title somewhere. Uh, but you have to read the label, uh, read the labels to make sure you're understanding what you're getting. Uh, the, the 3A, 
uh, is the amine version is very uh, readily dissolved in water. So you can use that during the growing season. Uh, but the um, ester formulation, the, the four or four E version uh, is dissolves in oil. So it's very, uh, we use that primarily in the winter time because we don't have to worry about uh, our sprayer freezing. Uh, we can use that uh, any any time during the winter when it's even colder temperatures. Uh, and that the oil that it use, is used as the carrier helps to um, uh, penetrate the the bark and the the wood of those cut stumps to get the herbicide into that root system and kill the plant. So the it's much more effective on the cut stumps. So again, uh, reading labels is important. Uh, there are formulations of these uh, herbicides or, or firm formulations with the herbicide uh, uh, triclopyr as the active ingredient uh, in, in many different um, hardware stores and garden centers. Uh, we just need to read the label to make sure that you're you're getting what you want. Uh, many of the uh, formulations that are sold as uh, kind of ready to use have very low concentrations of triclopyr. Um, again, we, we recommend using, uh, uh, for the cut stump treatment, having about 15% active ingredient uh, in, that, in that solution in order to effectively kill the cut stumps. Um, if you're doing foliar applications in the growing season to small stems, uh, we, can, we can use a, about a 5% solution of that, that herbicide. Uh, glyphosate, you know, trade name Roundup and other, other chemicals like that are also effective on buckthorn, but seem to be less effective, uh, which is why we're, we're trying to recommend the triclopyr as the, the uh, first alternative. Uh, when you, you, whatever herbicide you use, you want to make sure that you're using a surfactant or the oil car carrier in the wintertime in order to help that penetrate into the, the plant uh, and increase absorption, and it helps the effectiveness to control that plant. Uh, labels are legal documents. Uh, we can't just uh, purchase an herbicide and use it however we want, whenever we want. Uh, we need to follow those label directions. There's uh, very specific uh, recommendations for timing of, of applications as well as concentrations and use. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're using it appropriately so we're not having any off-target uh, impacts to the environment or the other desirable plants that might be growing in your landscape. Uh, so we have some recommendations for uh, some some tricks for for uh, how to how to do that. The, what you see here is a, a hockey stick swiper. So the the PVC tube of that is filled with the herbicide, and it slowly drips down into the the paint roller applicator at the at the bottom of that. So you can use that to apply herbicide to those cut stumps or to even the the small small stems that are are popping up in the landscape. A uh, very effective way to control uh, if you have larger numbers of of plants and doesn't require you to bend down and stoop down to treat each one. Uh, we also have the glove of death method, which you see uh, in the, the other photo there. Uh, we have uh, the person is wearing a, a chemical resistant glove. Uh, and then on top of that is some sort of a uh, absorbent glove or a car wash mitt is what's shown in this photo. But you can uh, apply herbicide to that outer glove uh, without worrying about uh, contacting your skin because you're wearing that chemical resistant underneath the chemical resistant glove underneath that. It allows you to be very targeted in how you apply this the herbicide if you have uh, small stems and seedlings coming up uh, intermixed with other species that are desirable. Uh, essentially, you can apply the herbicide to the glove and then whatever the glove touches or whatever you move through the landscape, your, your landscape plantings uh, will be treated with the herbicide and it won't affect the other plants. Uh, we've also developed some helpful tips for an herbicide application, uh, including the, the guide that you see here. Uh, with, with some of the same information. Uh, also uh, developed a, a recently developed Spanish version is, is also available. Uh, in anything that you do, we wanna make sure that you're keeping yourself safe through this process. So uh, again, keeping, uh, uh, making sure that you have the proper uh, protective equipment uh, for yourself. So if you're doing herbicide applications, you wanna make sure you have a long sleeve shirt, long pants, uh, chemical resistant gloves, uh, closed toed shoes and socks, uh, protective eyewear. Um, and if you're using a chainsaw to uh, cut down the buckthorn, uh, making sure that you have all that same equipment uh, as well as hearing protection. Uh, and the person in this photo is wearing what you see here, the, the orange covering to their legs are called chainsaw chaps, uh, which are protective uh, equipment, which are cut 
resistant. I won't say they're cut proof, but they're cut resistant. That can really uh, be a, a good uh, safeguard if you're not familiar with using a saw or, or even if you are familiar with using a saw, uh, it's a good uh, practice to wear those chainsaw chaps to protect your legs uh, from, from potential accidents. As we're almost at the end of our program here, there's, I just wanted to uh, re-emphasize the fact that um, uh, buckthorn is not just an issue or a concern for the forest preserves. Uh, it crosses it crosses property boundaries. Um, it is it makes up more than half of the tree landscape in Lake County and 36 percent of all trees in the Chicago region. Um, it didn't get that way overnight, and it's also not going to go away overnight. Uh, but with you know sustained effort from neighbors, communities, nonprofits, government agencies, um, businesses, uh, garden clubs, municipalities, all sorts of partners, um, we really can make a difference uh, for native plants and animals um, and, and other native species. So if I wanted, if I could leave you with just three tips, uh, three takeaways uh, to bring uh, home from this program, which is uh, removing buckthorn at home, but not only at home, also in your neighborhood, uh, at your workplace, at your at your school, at your children's school, uh, at your faith institution, um, any any kind of of natural landscape that you might have have influence or control over, um, please consider removing and replacing buckthorn. Um, as you're doing that, you know don't. Don't be shy about it. Uh, talk to your neighbors, your family, friends, coworkers, and acquaintances. Uh, explain what you're doing. Um, you know, celebrate your successes with them. Uh, you know, um, buckthorn removal can be you know a long-term you know commitment over multiple years. So it it helps to you know to keep talking about it to to have the, a wider support network as as you're going through this. Um, and lastly volunteer. Uh, perhaps, you know, you are, you're already ahead of the curve and you've removed buckthorn a long time ago from, from your property. Um, that's great and, and, and excellent. And, uh, we invite you to, uh, to volunteer and continue to do that on other properties, particularly in the forest preserves. Uh, so there's more information available about, uh, volunteer opportunities on our website at lcfpd.org slash volunteer. And that will be um, in the uh, description for the video as well. And well, we will not be taking questions here live today, but there are some further resources that we'd like to provide to you. Um, if you've watched this, uh, this program and you have questions specific to your property or your situation, uh, please feel free to send them to the email address there, uh, healthyhedges at lcfpd.org. Matt and I receive and respond to those messages. Um, the web pages I mentioned before, there are those, those URLs again, lcfpd.org slash buckthorn and slash native plants. Um, you may also be curious or, or wondering about where you can purchase native plants. Um, we do hold an annual native plant sale, uh, typically on Mother's Day weekend uh, at Independence Grove Forest Preserve in Libertyville. Um, so uh, there more information about that can be found at lcfpd.org slash plant sale. Um, in the fall, we also host an annual October, October, October native tree and shrub sale. Uh, typically on the first Sunday of October, um, and more information on that will be available on our website. And one of our key partners uh, regionally uh, for these uh, these efforts is the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, which Matt has, has referenced a couple times today, and their website is chicagorti.org. Um, and I should mention, if you really enjoyed this presentation and perhaps you are a member of, of a garden club or a book club or uh, a nonprofit, uh, 
uh, some other community group, municipality, uh, and you would like Matt and I to come present this in person uh, to, to your group, uh, we do offer um, uh, a traveling version, in-person version of this presentation. Uh, we will come to your, your office, uh, your library, your village hall, wherever it may be, um, whatever space you may have, uh, and present this program to as, as many folks as you can gather. So um, more information on how to get in touch with that, with us for that is on our website, or you can also just send us an email at that address on the slide. So I think at this point, this is all uh, we have for you today, but I wanted to uh, thank you, uh, say thank you to everyone for watching. Um, and also thank you in advance uh, for uh, removing buckthorn from your property and working to create uh, healthy habitats in your community. Uh, you are making a difference. Uh, you know, we are making headway um, and, and, it's, and it's a big group effort. So thank you for being a part of it. And Matt, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, I think you, you said everything there. Uh, thank you for watching and thank you for your interest in controlling buckthorn in your community. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you to everyone watching. Uh, have a great day and uh, we'll talk to you soon.